Hey, all my IFG friends, this is Steve. I want to say, you know, if you like movies like I do, we've started a new podcast called Happy Hour Flicks. Uh, you can find it anywhere podcasts are found. It's all about nostalgic movies that we love, and we bring on special guests each episode, and we also have specialty cocktails made for each one, too. So it really is an hour of a good time talking about movies that we love, like Gremlins, uh, Seven, uh, Free Willy. Uh, we talk about The Last Starfighter all. Also, I mean, we kind of run the gamut across all the decades and really have a great time. So I wanted to invite you to come over and join us at Happy Hour Flicks, anywhere podcasts are found. This is the, the independent, independent, independent filmmaker's guide from Framework Productions. Framework, Framework Productions. What's up, guys? It's nice to meet you both. Um, thank you very much for coming on the show. Um, we just got to watch, James and I just got to see your great new horror film, The Gin. Is it The Gin? Is that how you say it? That is how you say it, yes. The Gin. Yeah, The Gin. Um, a lot of fun and really, really enjoyed it. So, But tell me a little bit about what, what made you guys want to get involved and do this project in the first place. Well, it's kind of an interesting story. The thing that prompted us to to want to do this story is uh, we have a, another movie that's uh, coming out later this year. And that was actually due to shoot uh, first in 2018 originally, um, but it got pushed. Uh, you know, a lot of movies do for various reasons. And so uh, we had kind of resolved that that was gonna be the year that we were gonna make our, our first movie. Um, our first feature. And so we just were like, okay, let's figure out a way to make it happen. And it the, it led to us making the gin. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so did you write this did you write the gin it's the boy behind the doors the other movie you have coming out right correct yeah yeah so would you write them both at the same time how did the screenplays come about you guys are co-writers right david yeah we we are co-writers we we collaborate on everything together um well for the gin we wrote it very quickly we wrote it um in just a couple of weeks knowing like the timeline that we wanted to shoot it in um, we sort of wrote it around the restraints we had and the resource, the very limited resources we had at our disposal. We had access to an apartment for like a month and, um, we had already auditioned this really talented kid, Ezra for Boy Behind the Door. And we thought it would be great to sort of craft the story around those two elements. Um, and it's, it was definitely the quickest story we've ever written. We had to do some rewrites actually during filming were, that were uh, pretty stressful, but um, normally we like to really take time to develop our stories and everything a lot longer. It was pretty crazy because we found out, I think that, I think we found out in like June of 2018 that Boy Behind the Door was getting pushed. And so, and we didn't decide right away that we were gonna like resolve on like, okay, this is, we're gonna make sure that we'd make a movie this year. So we kind of like took another like month or so while we thought about that. And we're like, no, we can make this happen. Um, but we had one of the resources we had at our disposal was um, an apartment. Um, so we knew we had an apartment. We knew we had Ezra. Um, but the apartment was going to expire at the end of, when was it, David? End of like October? End of October. October yeah. um, and so, like, basically, we started writing it in August. Um, <laughs> And then we, uh, yeah, we were a go um, uh, at the end of September. Wow. So, um, <laughs> so yeah. you'll have to forgive me too, like, because the, 
this this the gin the whole movie's based around kind of like a metaphysical kind of like demon you know mystical i, I don't really have the words is that based in anything true or is that like a, a myth you guys knew about or just make up this character so so with uh with the gin so basically it's it is based on like a you know gin are are things that exist in mythology I'll, i guess i'll get into that a little bit basically where <laughs> <laughs> get it i can tell how excited you are get into the weeds man this is this, is, this uh, podcast is now all about mythology we'll start it's a, we'll I'm, not go, I'm not gonna go too into the mythology <laughs> yeah i mean like really with the story what we we wanted to do was uh really formulated around um like dylan's character and we knew like since we had this apartment um and uh, we had like neighbors around that we wanted to be respectful of because we were going to be shooting at night. We were like, okay, well, how can we make this as quiet as possible, even though we want this to be really, you know, exciting? So we we're like, okay, well, we can't have like this kid screaming and like scaring all the neighbors and feeling like a kid's in danger. So um, we ended up like, you know, that's how he became like mute. And we were like, okay, organically out of that, um, you know, we decided like that we wanted him to make you know, a wish and like everything with the backstory with the, the mom and everything came out of that um, without spoiling anything. Um, but uh, so because of that and all of our research and we are big fans of like, you know, old school horror. And one of the things that we've seen in the past was uh, Wishmaster, which kind of introduced us to the, to Jin in general. Um, and doing more research about Jin, we um, discovered that they're like really across a whole bunch of cultures. Like, you know, some are like affiliated with like religious cultures, but then there are some that were affiliated with even like the occult. And we were like, okay, let's lean in on um, the occult version because that seems kind of more in keeping with what we <laughs> want to do with this story. Um, and that's kind of where why why we ended up like you know coming up with a gin as our antagonist for the for the story i don't know if that's i feel like that was a very roundabout way of answering no yeah that. and honestly we kind of got the cart before the horse here i should have already asked so for the people who have not seen the films it comes out friday uh the fourth may 14th friday may 14th for someone that's not seen it what is the gin what is your how, how do you pitch it in a couple of lines uh I'll, okay, I'll say this last thing. I keep, I keep going. <laughs> but, um, basically, it's about a mute boy who, uh, after uh, trying to make a wish to achieve his heart's greatest desire, ends up summoning a sinister presence into his apartment. And that and, is the gym. And, the, and, that's a, and, and there's a way you summon him, right? You light a candle in the mirror, and this is all in the first act, so I'm not giving anything away. And you say something like three times or whatever. Do you, have you guys, individually, while you're filming this, who lit a candle in a mirror and said the phrases into the and, and psyched themselves out at night? I, d <laughs> I don't think either of us did that. But you're too it's... terrified. You're all you're too terrified. But you're just gonna have a little kid do it while we're rolling. Like, should it happens to him, we at least know it wasn't us. <laughs> and it's that like quintessential horror thing where you're watching somebody do something you're like oh don't do this oh don't do this so how how was that like is that where how much were you guys thinking about the structure of a horror movie when you're writing so that's ultimately i think we're going here right so like how when you're developing it so quickly how important was it to how, how did you develop that tension i think well i think one thing justin was touching on we really did we really did approach the story from like thinking about character and theme um and then from there we thought i think about tension and making suspenseful sequences but going in definitely i don't think it like we were trying to like come up with something that would be super scary i think we were trying to come up with something that would be suspenseful and more mysterious 
Um, and, you know, the first, like, third is is pretty lighthearted. Like, we did want it to feel a little bit fun and playful, and we like that sense of adventure, um, even though he is just a boy in a really simple apartment. We wanted to have a little bit, like, of an essence of, like, wonder. Like, you find this magical book. There could be endless possibilities. Um, I feel like that's a really anticlimactic answer <laughs> to your... <laughs> Uh, question? I'll um, add on to it. I mean, I guess that in general with David and I, like, I think coming up with our stories, uh, for the most part, we always approach it from a character perspective. And I think that we're really big advocates of the idea that, you know, a good horror story should like they exist like without the scares too you know like you have to have like a really good a good story that surrounds you know characters that you care about have a strong emotional core and then once you have all that foundation then you get to build in all the fun stuff all the like you know the real tension and like the the scares and so like like david said we we didn't go into it being like all right let's like think of like you know this all these like scares and everything and then like build a story around that we really came at it from a all right who's this character what's his emotional journey um what are the themes we want to explore and once we have all that down structurally then we get to put in all the like fun beats of like making this a thrill ride right totally and that i think that absolutely makes sense so I want to talk a little bit about pre-production a little bit more in a second, but let's jump ahead to how you actually shot it. So you knew you built into the resources you knew you had, like an apartment, lead cast. How many days did you guys end up shooting and what did your general scope of production look like? We shot for, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, Justin, we shot for two weeks. Um, they were, was it five day weeks or six day weeks? I think they were, I think they were six day weeks. Yeah. Six day weeks. Um, we were still shooting. We still, we were still shooting with a kid. So obviously that restricts our hours to just five hours a day with the kid. Yeah. I was um, about to ask. I mean, that sounds like, I'm sure that was a real pain to really schedule and get together. Yes and no. I mean, luckily Ezra is just such a talented actor that he kind of just gets it on the first or second take. Um, so that really wasn't a struggle. Uh, he also, you know, learned sign language really fast, which also is miraculous. Um, you know, if you have good actors, they really make your job and good crew also like amazing. We had an amazing DP and he had an amazing crew. It just makes everything go so much faster. It's like a well-oiled machine. Um, It was pretty small, right? Like it was, I think it was, I, so we did have people that had to like rotate out for like other jobs occasionally, but I think that like total on set, we would ever have at a time was 12. Um, so it was, and sometimes even less, um, <laughs> but yeah, like total like actual crew that we would ever have on set was, was 12 but people. That's also including like studio teacher and positions that don't really yeah, yeah. Um, but a lot of people had to kind of double up on on duties or just really like you know I mean we we did have um, like a gaffer but like our DP really did have to like handle a lot of different aspects of the production and post-production uh, I ended up having to do the bulk of the editing. David was the production designer. Um, like, there's just a lot of kind of overlapping and wearing many hats. Yeah, wearing many hats. So, well, you did a great job. I think the look of the film is very good. And uh, did you edit? You edited the film also, Justin? I did. Yeah. Going back to the production design, though, I mean, I thought that was excellent. The movie has such a consistent feel throughout. I actually wanted to ask, you know. In big studio movies, that's usually achieved through a you know healthy art department uh, budget. But for you guys, um, you know, did you? How much did you uh, to to establish a co a cohesive look like that? Um, what did you do in terms of pre production? Did you buy a lot of props, or did you? It was it mostly done with lighting. 
Well, thank you for saying that. The production design is like the one thing that I wish we had a little bit more time and money to really develop. Um, and yeah, we had to do a lot of it ourselves. It really was um, just a collaboration with our DP, you know, before talking about sort of defining all the spaces. The great thing about the apartment we had is that it has like a circular layout. So it allows for, there's no, there's never really like a dead end. Character can always go left or right. Um, and then in terms of just like dressing space, it was really just bits and pieces that we had. We knew since we couldn't like develop it maybe full, like as fully as we'd like because of budgetary restraints and time restraints. Again, that was like a, a story thing that came out of that. We thought, well, maybe they just move in so it's a lot more sparse. Um, we can keep it very simple and um, clean and very generic and very plain, intentionally plain. Yeah, I mean, and that it comes across, and I think it really makes it more suspenseful and scary. You know, even just having that TV uh, in the dining room like that, and having nothing else, um, makes you know really sets a sets the stage and kind of feels creepy in a way. Thank you. <laughs> I feel so, like Dave's always very self conscious about the production design, so it's really nice. That you no, guys you shouldn't be. You shouldn't. I be. absolutely. I would. I would say that's a, a highlight of the movie for sure. I mean, I felt it, and then the way the music can co like comes into that as well. I, I thought it was very well realized. And there are two creatures, like two distinctive cre. You, you get without giving away too much. You get away with some not always having to show, but then occasionally do show two distinctive creatures in the film, monsters. And I thought they were both really kind of iconic, you know, when, in, in the film. They really were great set pieces. Can you talk about the design of the djinn uh, when you see it uh, first and the few times you do? Yeah, so that developed also along the way. Um, one of the rewrites, actually, that David addressed earlier. Um, so since we did have such a low budget on this movie, um, we had an um, absolutely incredible um, special effects makeup artist who, I mean, uh, same Gage Hubbard, and we love, like, I mean, we want to work with him on everything. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but we didn't have, like, the budget to, you know, for him to actually create the original uh, design that we had come up with because it was so, like, intricate. Dave and I are always very, like, you know, shooting for the stars. <laughs> and we're just like, yeah, sure, we can we can make this, like, really uh, specific design for this creature with this no budget. Um, but alas, we kind of couldn't for, you know, a sustained amount of time. So uh, originally, we were actually going to see uh, the djinn, like, in his true form pretty much throughout the majority of uh, the film. But uh, the thing that ended up changing was it taking the multiple forms, which fortunately when we did more research is like, that's a really like important part of its lore and well, and a lot of the different lores that it, it has. So um, we're like, oh, this works absolutely perfectly. So it allowed us to kind of inject seemingly more of a, like more cast in there while also uh, kind of keeping the budget down, but also in a lot of ways, it it makes it scarier and also obviously really resonates more emotionally later when there's a reveal that we won't, I guess, talk about right now. Um, but uh, so, uh, but yeah, the design uh, for the, the gin in general was just us working really closely with Gage and him really just kind of being uh, always on his toes and being able to just like roll with the punches when he had to adjust with the limited resources too. So it, it's really, it was really great just having so many people on this crew that were able to adjust to, you know, everything that we were just working with. Everybody kind of had a lot of restrictions and yeah, I assume most of the, when you do see the gin itself, I assume it's mostly practical, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so it, I, I take it by the silence completely practical. <laughs> There's some enhancements uh, the, the on a, in a, f a few times, and there are some times I think you can tell like that had to have been a, a visual effect. Um, mm. But um, yeah, most of it is just Gage's awesome work. So, <laughs> <laughs> and that's also like the, there's another creature in that has like the great 
like teeth and like great like a really strong look and you showcase it at the right time when you see it you're like oh man that's really grabbing and it pays off in a very satisfying way that yeah that was that was him too <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're glad that that resonated with you though that was a that was a fun scene to shoot so two weeks about 12 person crew real stripped down i mean that's great that's a tight schedule for what 12 days that's a really really crazy tight schedule that's really impressive that you were able to do it on such a tight thing and you're probably because you did it in you know limited locations not much cast you could really probably do what you needed to do um how did you since this came about so late you were gonna you skip basically frog you know frog hopped your other movie with this one um, how did the development process being like, how did you get it up so quickly? Cause I assume it's, you know, obviously it's a low budget, but do you still have to run down the cash you need, the crew you need, the people you do, and then you have to edit it and all that. I'm kind of impressed you're able to do that and then do another movie and have two coming out in one year. That's really impressive. Thank you. Um, and really thank you. Well, there's two of us, so it really makes life a lot easier. Um, we can like, you know, one of us can handle one fire, another of us can handle the other, and we just like tag team all our problems. It, it's really like really useful. I feel all directors should have a directing partner because there is a lot to do. I don't really know how we we did pre production so quickly. We just we just knew the the date we needed to start shooting by because we sort of backtracked it from when we wouldn't have access to the apartment anymore, and we just did it. Just like Nike, you just do it. You just find a way. I mean, you find a way or you don't do it. <laughs> it was, it was really just about like, just ma like we had, you know, I guess even in terms of like, you know, getting the movie funded, it was a combination of, you know, uh, like say our own savings and also just like, you know, getting in touch with, uh, people that we knew could help finance the the movie and um and really I think having that date was a really like we knew the date you know and I think that that's a big thing with uh filmmaking in general that um everything kind of works around like if you have a date and you're going to people being like we have these hard dates that we're going to be shooting on like things come together much much faster when you have like an idea where it's like, oh, I want to shoot a movie and you don't really necessarily know when it's going to be a go. You know, even if you, let's say you have like some like funds, maybe even more funds than what we had for this movie. If you don't have that like date where you're ready to go, I, it's so much harder to like actually pull things together. And I think that just having that and going out to people and being like, hey, we're shooting a feature on in this window, like, uh, do you want to be a part of it really helped like just get things together quickly because they were like, oh, well, um, sure. Like I am free. And since it's coming up so quickly, like they knew if they were available or not, you know, they didn't have like uh, other jobs in the rafters and they were like, so it was, it made that part of the job a little bit easier because, you know, we got to reach out to a lot of our, our connections and just, uh, you know, see if they were like, down for the cause you know coming up in a month or so so um like, yeah i can't tell you how many people we've talked to and that is like a consistent theme of like when movies are get actually made and get done they you know people say this is the date and you all of a sudden start pushing towards something and saying you because no one ever comes and does it for you right and like you never no one ever walks up and be like oh you have a fantastic idea i'd like to give you a bunch of money and help you make it that just doesn't work that way <laughs> no. So the moment you start saying, I feel like here it is, everyone finally gets it. Yeah. So that, you have that, your you have your team in place, you have your actor, you have your location. What about your camera package? What camera did you shoot with? What lenses and what did your lighting package look like as well? So we shot with uh, an Alexa Mini, I think it was a mini. We we lean very heavily on our our DP. We're very visual uh, storytellers and so we we know what we want our stories to look like and how like we want the end product to come out with and we really try to convey that very clearly and then we leave um him to figure out how to actually 
um, get the technical equipment <laughs> necessary. But actually in this case, I uh, did use a lot of, um, I used to work at um, Lionsgate Entertainment, like just desk job, like <laughs> for many years, but uh, it was in post-production and um, had a connection to um, a uh, post facility called uh, HD Cinema. And they also rent out cameras. And so since I was you know, really tight with them still, they gave us a really great deal on uh, this, this mini that they were like, yeah, it's, it's once again, having that date. And they were like, it's not gonna be <laughs> out at that time. They're like, sure, we can, we can spare this. Uh, and so they gave it to us a really discounted rate. Um, and that's how we were able to secure that. <laughs> when, did you, when did you guys shoot this? Um, was it September, end of September 2018 through mid October, early October, however long that was. Yeah, like mid ish. It was like the very end of September. In 2018. Uh, yeah. And then you, I see. And then did you edit this first or go straight into the next movie? So we, so we cut, we got through, I think, a little like beyond, uh, I guess it was telling, everything feels like a director's cut of this <laughs> because. You know, I guess there isn't like a studio cut. Um, the director but, is editing. <laughs> um, we got through, I guess, the first few like couple cuts of this uh, before uh, Boy Behind the Door actually got greenlit. And then we had to take a break, hop on Boy Behind the Door, fully finish that. And then we came back to the gin, which is why. Honestly, that might have been a huge blessing because being able to hold off that long, what was it like coming back and watching it after stepping away from it for, what, nine months? It felt amazing. Um, it felt like, I don't know, just a sense of, you know, you really put a lot of your energy and your hopes into trying to make something that, you know, that you're proud of or that people might enjoy and it really was just like all the pieces kind of came together in that one with Ezra's amazing acting Matthew's amazing score Julian's amazing cinematography like um it felt really good it felt good for a lot of reasons but um it was just a totally different experience from what we went through with on boy behind the door which was you know a much bigger budget a much bigger crew a lot less creative control. I will say, uh, to answer one of the things about um, the like the camera lighting setup, uh, for the gin, we, we approached it, we wanted to shoot it very practically, again, because of like the budget, but we really didn't have any studio lights. We had one like LED thing that they put in the bathroom, but the rest, because of budget and time, was just like a couple practical lamps and that can really save you a lot of time and money if you're like doing an independent project. That was also the reason why we wanted the Alexa Mini is because it, it really does pick up light a lot better. It's a lot more sensitive, I guess. Yeah, and those ultra primes will be going to be very fast too. I mean, I love shooting that way. I love shooting with just, you know, one china ball in a stand or one, you know, light mat and then a bunch of lamps and practicals around and just little dimmers. I mean, you'd be surprised how much you can really make something look very... And you can move fast, too, because you can point the camera anywhere you want, and there's only one light to screw with. Sometimes you get, like, six lights in there or four lights in there all in stands. To move the camera two inches now requires 20 minutes to move this and this and change this and get the flag out of there. And, you know, and then the actors are sitting around and being like, when are we going to do this? <laughs> did you guys shoot actually at nighttime, or did you black out the apartment? We did black out the apartment, uh, and we also shot... Uh, and tonight a little bit, but since we had, you know, those limited hours with Ezra, we at the very latest had to be finished with him uh, by 1230, but oftentimes it was sometimes even like 10. Mm -hmm. So we had to, we had to black out um, the windows. And so the certain scenes where you're actually kind of seeing out the windows a little bit, we just had to time it so that that was actually happening um, during our night window. Um, so but, what was it? I mean, what was your guys' experience? For anybody that's ever filmed in a practical location that's blacked out during the day, multiple days in a row, it gets pretty depressing about day three when you're like sitting in a little apartment with six people, 
and you're like, you can hear all the, the windows are blacked out, and it's yeah. all black, and it's got that, you know, the air isn't really flowing great. You're just sitting there being like, how am I, uh, you know, the, the, the different careers feeling real good right right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it is always surreal when you like open the apartment door and then it's like sun is blaring and you feel blinded. <laughs> um. I guess it was the most stressful thing really was just trying to figure out how we were going to make our days and how we were going to be able to get the shots that we had like planned. We shot listed it very thoroughly and, you know, the visuals are really important to us. So we don't like repeating one angle a bunch of times just for coverage. We like to always try <laughs> one angle and speed it up or zoom in. It's just, it's so, so not, um, like low standards um so we really wanted to push ourselves to always try to you know have the shots be evolving and constantly different because you can only look at a, a blank apartment for so long before it just becomes like visually boring so we tried to lean on the visuals being a little bit more interesting um so i don't think i answered the question what was the question no, that was I. It was more of a statement than a question. <laughs> it is about the feeling of it being depressing in there. I mean, it, it, it wasn't though. I mean, I, 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 I do think that it felt like it could have run the risk of that, <laughs> but there was something about like just because it was such a small crew and everything just felt so like gorilla and free that it was just like we were just kind of just trying to have a good time as much as possible you know our our lead is a kid so we always kind of had to keep things fun for him um and so i think that really helped uh make it so that like you know there were times where it was really stressful but at you know at the end of the day i don't think anyone was just like oh get me out of this apartment mm. like, <laughs> how about no. working with you guys did two movies in a row with a lead that's a kid so what is it what is your approach to working with a kid versus an adult you know seeing as we haven't really worked too much with adults <laughs> you, you'll find out whenever you grow up <laughs> we'll, find, we'll find out right um i mean we did have we did have some experience with obviously a little bit on on the gen with rob uh and tevi and there, there are adults in that um, and also more so in, in Boy Behind the Door. Um, I think that the approach we really try to take with, you know, kids is, especially like this really takes place in like the casting process. You're really just trying to find a kid that you feel can, can embody this character and then just can feel like they're being themselves on set, essentially. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, with, uh, Ezra and this and, and Lonnie and Ezra and Boy Behind the Door, like, w you know, we found kids that just, they were so just like natural when you talk to them and like they, you know, everything that we had envisioned in these characters, like they were just able to embody and it, it was effortless. Um, so, uh, so it was just really easy to just say like, all right, uh, you're scared now. Say this line, <laughs> like they were just, <laughs> um, so, uh, or you know, in the case of the gen, just like you're scared now, and you don't have to say any lines, but run away this way, and as would nail it. So, um, like, but you know, with adults, it's it's fun because you actually do get to go a little bit more into like the you know the what the characters like psyche is at that moment, and like you know, kind of what their their backstory is. Um, and to really help them figure out the emotional state that they want to be in as an actor, um, and like we're how, like getting helping them get to that place by just explaining who this character is, what's going on in the moment in this uh, in the story here, um, and I don't know, it's kind of fun. You get to have this dialogue where they're kind of creating this character with you in a way, like where you know you had a you had an idea of this character when especially if you you were wrote it also you had an idea of this character when you were putting it down on the page and uh obviously the actor wants to bring that to life but they're also injecting their own like uh personality into it in a way that you never would have expected and it really makes the character and the role evolve in this fun way 
um, and just kind of talking through that process um, and getting there is just, it's really fascinating and fun. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know, it leads to a lot of cool discoveries. Um, and you do get those discoveries with kids too. I'm not trying to take anything away from that, but it is like, you know, it's a little bit of a, a different process that's, that's interesting and entertaining. Yeah, absolutely. So now let's jump ahead a little bit. So all done. How long did you, you edited it in two chunks. Once you got to kind of finishing the cut, what was your next steps? How did you take an approach to, you know, finishing the film and then getting it out into the world, getting it seen? Did you go, you know, because festivals in 20, so this would have been 2020 when you guys were trying to shop this, right? I mean, it hasn't come out yet. So how did you get, how'd you get the film out there? How did we get the film out there? It's kind of a blur. Um, it's a blur, isn't it? <laughs> kind of a blur. It's well, always we... a, it's always such a journey, right? And then last year, which was probably the big year you were planning on your festival circuit, uh, was you know twenty twenty, right? So how did that how did that affect the journey and the trajectory for the the release of the film? It was a little bit more unique, I think, in our situation, just because. We did have our other movie, Boy Behind the Door, and that was also finished at the same time. Um, and that was being shopped around. So a lot of the places that were interested in that movie happened to also want to want to see our other movie. And um, again, a really unique situation. Uh, we're obviously really thankful that it worked out that way, but. Um, you know, one of the places that was looking at one of the other movie happened to see this movie and they uh, they really liked it. They really saw something in it. So um, I don't think it works out that way most of the time. The festivals, um, we didn't really do a lot of festivals for the gin until really after it got uh, interest in being picked up. We're not big. Uh, I don't think we make festival movies fair enough i mean it's a it's a specialized thing for sure but i mean it doesn't i mean you already had an interest in distribution that's why most people are going to a festival in the first place right right <laughs> i mean i think you might do you, i mean I, do you think you really benefited sounds like you really did from having two films in a similar genre really packaged at the same time so you could kind of just it's like you're almost marketing two of two for one as filmmakers that was definitely uh, a benefit and we did not we didn't see that coming. Uh, I don't, cause I, I also just don't think at the time that we were even, you know, developing the gin that we ever thought that they would both be finishing at the same time. We, we thought there was going to be a lag, um, between them. And, you know, so it was, it was really, it, it was really fortunate. And I actually, I mean, I won't go into it, but the, the gin actually also helped get, way behind the door made in a way um so there's a lot of like that's a whole different story but there are just a lot of like things where this movie has impacted uh just the story around this movie and everything with it's it's impacted our lives in a really cool and crazy way that we just never work begets work right and an object in motion stays in motion so the fact that you guys had two projects just to kind of you know i'm sure the second you were done with one you had bounced back to the other one and and back and forth um you know i do want to say we skipped over music and i know music the score in your film is such i think a big part of it and you even you know seems to me that you planned for it practically with your shots of you know there's shots of the stereo and how the stereo and the headphones play into the set and things like that so at what point did you have your the person who was doing your score involved is that all in post or did you have that planned ahead of time or or how did that process come about um oh go ahead go ahead um well we really wanted to infuse music in the story um we didn't find our composer until after we had shot and put together a cut. Um, and we had met with a few people, our producer, Ryan Scaringe, uh showed us the, the work of this one guy who we never heard of, Matthew James. And we were just like instantly blown away. He's just super talented. 
and he had a you know we explained to him we wanted it to feel a little bit retro um like late 80s you know we grew up in the the 90s so we love that era um it's like <laughs> and um but we also wanted to feel familiar and not dated so um it was just you know a really collaborative process just really trying to explain you know what we were envisioning for the scenes but then also there was a lot of moments of discovery when you know he would show us something and it just blew our minds like this is way better than we ever could have envisioned would he yeah. show it to you like in the edit would you would you have it like uh synced into to a shot or just would he just play it for you and you would imagine where it would be and he would uh he would sync them into shot mm -hmm. we would yeah. we would go in this was before before COVID, <laughs> uh, we would go into his uh, his studio and the shots would be synced and we'd play through the scenes with music he's come up with and he'd be like, do you like it like this or maybe like this? And it's just like, everything you're doing is just amazing. Um, it just, it's just really like a testament. You just really have to try to find like talented people, but also it's so corny to say like nice people, easy to work with people, collaborative people. Like these are traits that are really not common, it seems, in the industry. So when you or to get all all in one, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody who you enjoy working with who isn't an asshole that's also talented. That's you know, that <laughs> exactly. the trifecta. It's a trifecta. Um, so when um who colored the piece where did you do color and also the, how did you do uh, two things on top of this real quick just where did you color it and what process was that like but more importantly i think developing the sound of the creatures like you know like the sound of the world they're very you know horror is very specific especially when it's like a thriller like tense moments it's so important the sound design well yeah with the sound design i mean well, i'm gonna touch on matthew's story again just really quickly because like i mean it totally, especially just how he brought to life like his theme work with like Dylan, where Dave and I are both really like score nuts, like in general. And I, I mean, personally, I don't even, I'm a weirdo and I don't listen to anything kind of, but like instrumental and like music scores. And I was always like telling like Matthew, like how I've like, one of my dreams was always just have like this, <laughs> like, a movie score that I was really like excited about and like proud of that you know was affiliated with a movie that I made and I mean he's like he he has done that for us on the chin which is so cool and it's on such a small movie um and now sorry the the, uh, the soundtrack is going to have a release oh that's very cool like as part of your your release package you're doing a soundtrack release yeah comes out on the 21st of may so he gets cool. like yeah the album's being released and it's also going to include the the three songs that have that by time cop that are in there which that was such a great find um <laughs> and the fact that jordy was willing to actually let us use his music in the movie and so cool. is it just called the gin soundtrack is that how people would find it yeah it'll just be called the i think i think soundtrack but it's definitely it's going to be called the gin like score or soundtrack but it probably soundtracks since it includes time cop on there too yeah with but, those soundtrack with those soundtrack songs where did you find those and sync them in yourselves in the rough and then go to the artist or did the somebody say hey you should check out this music how did how'd you find this we had different songs originally in their attempt in and then we found out that we couldn't get those songs because they were outside of our budget and um, a combination of David and um, we have a music supervisor who's working on it, uh, Carter Armstrong, did some searching and uh, found Time Cop. And uh, we found out that we could use his music. <laughs> um, and so, and it was just perfect. And so we got to just, that's when we like, we basically swapped out the other songs and we re-edited it slightly to, you know, just make sure everything like matched the timing of those those particular pieces that we used. Um, Got it. But then, in general, with the I think the sound in general, like what you were saying, you know, with the sounds of the the gin, we actually really wanted to pare back um, the amount that we hear uh, the gin itself, um, and really kind of lean in more on this 
you know, sometimes a, a quieter atmosphere where, you know, you can't really tell where the score ends and like the atmosphere begins. Um, and we also like really wanted like Matthew's score a chance like to have a chance to, to shine um, <laughs> whenever we, you know, had the, the moment to the opportunity to let it do so. Um, so, uh, but, you know, sound is just, yeah, it's super, super important to us. Every time that we're even like um, conceiving something on the page, we're thinking about, you know, what the uh, soundscape for the, the movie is going to be. Sound is just like, everyone knows it's like, arguably like the most important thing in, in horror. You like, especially when you don't have people speaking, which is interesting. Um, so all of that just um, like it was it was a it was a, an interesting process putting that all together. What do you guys think you know what what have you learned from the process of doing these movies that you would you know hand off to other people trying to make their own film? something you would suggest you know things you could you know you've learned from your process that you can you know pass along i I think that the biggest I guess I'll approach it as saying like the biggest thing that we've learned from this uh, that I think is a really good takeaway is just like, you've got to just like, if you believe in something, you've got to just go for it. Like don't like this industry is kind of like structured to, to deliver a lot of rejections and a lot of ways to kind of almost prevent you from making movies, it seems. Um, and, you know, you'll have things where you'll get like a delay or you'll get, you know, like you'll seem like you have an opportunity and all of a sudden that opportunity seems to slip through your fingers. But like you just need to kind of keep like pushing and not give up. <laughs> uh, and it's, I know it's super corny to say, um, but it's I think it's all about just like sticking, sticking with your goals in this industry and just not backing down and kind of always trying to find a way to be creative to get things done. Um, that's the only reason that this this movie exists. It's just because, you know, it's not because we had it planned for, you know, all these years and it was, this was our one dream project that we really wanted to, always wanted to get off the ground. It was like, no, we want to make a movie this year and um, the movie that we had been dreaming of getting on the ground for forever, like wasn't getting off the ground. So we're like, let's do something that we can do on our own and make it happen. And so uh, you gotta just find a place to start somewhere and just like make it happen. Thank you guys very much for coming on and talking with us about the film and definitely check out The Gin. Um, and David, J uh, Justin's great to get, have, get to talk to you guys. Thank you, it was great talking to you guys too. Thank you so much. Filmmaking is a collaborative experience, and so is this podcast. Follow us on Instagram at Framework underscore Productions for upcoming episode announcements and leave your questions in the comments for our future guests. Please take a second to subscribe so you know about future episodes and leave a review. It really does help us. For more information about today's guest, visit independentfilmmakersguide.com. IFG is a community, and we want to help you in your filmmaking process. Hi, I'm Gordon Christmas, a film lighting designer from Brooklyn, New York, and I'm reading the credits. IFG is created by Framework Productions. This episode was directed by James Allardyce, produced and edited by Matt Mundy and Audrey Ray McHale, and hosted by Stephen Pierce. The music is by Glassboy. Find his music on freemusic.org. Listen and see all the IFG episodes plus bonus content at independentfilmmakersguide.com. Thanks for listening. Hey, friends, we just wanted to take a quick moment to talk about two personal things. First, we wanted to thank you, our listening community, and our wonderful guests, learning so much together along the way and continuing to learn, sharing our stories, making a lot of new friends, and collaborating, which is exactly what this is all about. Which also brings me to my second point. In great part to many of these new relationships, we wanted to let you know that we've taken a lot of this advice ourselves and made our own narrative feature film, Herd, H-E-R-D, Herd, which is premiering 
this October on Friday the 13th in select theaters as well as on VOD. Personally, I think it's the perfect kind of scary movie to watch during our favorite scary season. So we'd love for you to celebrate with us and watch Herd. You can pre-order it on Apple TV and of course do the communal thing, see it in theaters. Of course, for all of this, please see our show notes, but basically we're going to keep it all updated at herd.film. That's H-E-R-D dot F-I-L-M, herd.film as well. Thank you again. And be sure to give us a rating and a review over on Apple Podcasts so we can continue to build this community and collaborate. IFG, how movies get made.